Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Depending where you are in the world, thank you for attending the Securing IoT Trust No Thing webinar. Before we dive into the presentation, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. If you have a question at any time during this webinar, please use the Ask a Question tab located below the player. Your question will be addressed during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. At the end of the webinar, please take a moment to rate this presentation and provide feedback using the Rate This tab below the player. There are additional resources for you to check out under Attachments under the player. You can download these items at any time. Finally, the recorded version of this presentation will be available using the same URL shortly following its conclusion. So feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues. Now I would like to introduce you to your speakers, Deborah Galea, Security Evangelist at OpsWAT, and Jianpeng Mo, also known as JP, OpsWAT's Vice President of Engineering. Over to you, Deborah. Thank you, John. Welcome, everyone, to our webinar today, where we will be talking about securing IoT. This is the agenda for today. Uh, firstly, I will start uh, talking about a couple of recent IoT security incidents and also what kind of data breaches we can expect in the future. Then I will hand it over to Yang Peng, who will discuss the reasons for IoT attacks and also the specific security challenges in the IoT environment. Next, JP will uh, describe the IoT kill chain and how we can protect against the threats in this kill chain, specifically how to address IoT firmware vulnerabilities and also how to prevent threats in IoT data and files. And then we will finish off by explaining more about how Opswap can help you secure your IoT environment. So just before we begin, I would like to tell you a little bit about Opswap for those of you who haven't heard of us yet. Uh, we are a cybersecurity company headquartered in San Francisco and we have a number of global offices around the world. We develop an advanced threat prevention platform called Opswot Metal Defender. And our solutions are trusted by over 1,000 organizations worldwide and more than 300 technology partners. So now we will start with our webinar. So I'm sure most of you have heard of uh, a lot of high-profile IoT security breaches, uh, for instance, the hijacking of self-driving vehicles and also the hacking of medical devices. Um, in this slide, we have listed recent IoT security incidents that have happened this year. So firstly, in January 2018, the Mirai variant, which is a botnet, was utilizing attacks on multiple companies in the financial sector. Then in March, the Hadzine botnet, uh, which exploited a vulnerability in the Microtik router firmware, allowed attackers to take over devices and perform over 860,000 scans within 72 hours. And then just in the last few months, the VPN filter malware managed to infect over 500,000 IoT devices including routers and network attached storage devices from leading vendors such as Netgear, D-Link, and Linksys. So unfortunately, we can expect to hear a lot more of these incidents. Um, just the number of IoT devices is growing exponentially. Uh, by the early 2020s, we expect 25 to 30 billion IoT devices worldwide. Um, of course, the more IoT devices we have, the more attacks we can expect. So by 2020, we already expect 25% of all cyber attacks to be targeting IoT devices. In a, a survey conducted in 2017 among 400 IT executives, 
had uh, responded that they had already experienced at least one IoT security breach. And the potential cost of an IoT breach was estimated to be more than $20 million for large companies and for the smaller companies up to 13% of annual revenue. So this is definitely a, uh, a problem that is on the rise. Now I will hand it over to JP who will talk more about I IoT security. Thank you, Deborah. Hi, everyone. This is JP. Um, I have the VP of Engineering in Upswa. Today, I'm here to talk a little bit about how um, Upswa's proposition about um, addressing the IoT attack. The first, I want to go through some of the reasons behind uh, why why people want to interest in doing an uh, attack through the IoT device. First of all, DDoS attack, ransomware attack, data and identity freeze and pre-leverating is the four traditional reasoning behind to actually set up or trigger IoT attack. On the diagram on the right side in the, in the presentation, it demonstrates um, most of the users acquire or buy some IoT device from the manufacturers, maybe spending a naughty amount of money. But uh, attacker comes in, spend a little bit of the resource, spend a little bit of the monkey, monkey, uh, money from the dark side, be able to acquire the information or some existing proven um, exploration code, so he will be able to attack the IoT device, set up a botnet, and then later on leverage the botnet to trigger a DDoS attack against certain target manufacturers or vendors, which will cost a significant amount of the money uh, lost. So the financial impact for deal for IoT attack full a DDoX and a um, full broadlet is very significantly increased in the last couple of years. But these are more traditional mechanisms. There's a lot of security industry, security standards, security products have been trying to adjust this particular usage, usage and the reasoning for these IoT attacks. However, in the last two years, there's some new information, there's some new reasonings have been triggered behind the IoT attacks, like um, cryptocurrency miners and cyber criminal as a service. So a lot of the attackers right now set up or just create a botnet and just hang in there and then use that as a service to um, trigger or initialize an attack in a certain later um, down the road. So let's talk a little bit about what is the cybersecurity, what is the IoT security challenge as today? Many of the existing devices um, cannot be patched just because the fact that an IoT device is usually designed for a specific reason, usually defined for a specific usage, and then it's not um, well maintained by the IT or the organization. Um, to the other sense, the shadow ID concept in the last couple years, a lot of the IT administrators maybe set up an IoT device and in the organization, and then keep it there running, maybe hook up, get deep into the network, hook up to the production um, environment. But later on, the IT admin who actually manage the device have been departed from the organization. Leave no one in the existing department will understand what is going on on the certain devices, which later on becoming nobody at the end will be able to touch or upgrade or patch these particular devices because they don't want to screw up the current production environment. Many of the devices are not designed to have the security features just because the limited or the captive power the particular device is de um, designed for. And then there's so many communication protocols, there's so many um, manufacturer protocols like the satellite, Wi-Fi, RF, RF, ID, Bluetooth, NFC, and etc. Lastly, but most importantly, the infection is spread really fast within the IoT network. And most of this attack is time sensitive. So there's no abnormal behavior can be possibly detected until the attack actually happens. So it's extremely difficult for an IT administrator or the existing solution to do the detect ahead of the time. I believe most of you are familiar with the cybersecurity Q chain. And as today, we want to study a little bit deeper in terms of the Q chain to fit into the IoT use cases. You can see it goes through the reconnaissance, C 
system, which basically is a discovery mechanism. So the attacker will swipe all the networks, either using a system toolkit or no vulnerability, basically connect all the connected things, information, so he will be able to set up their victim pool. And then later on, they try to uh, weaponize the, the stuff and then to deliver it, deliver the malware, deliver the infection components onto the IoT device. They're mainly going for two channels. The first one is a firmware upgrade. The second one is the data. The IoT data have designed to be processing, analyzing on or transfer certain data or files to the other devices or perform a certain actions. So the firmware and the data are the two main channels for um, for device will be able for IoT device will be able to get infected. Since the IoT device is such a limited compute power um, devices, it's really difficult to, it's just simply not realistic to set up a full-blown security solutions running, having running on the IoT device. So Upswan's perspective, since the device is so no power, how about we move the wall ahead? So we try to prevent the delivery phase of the press rather than securing the IoT de device itself. In here, we're going to talk a little bit deeper around these two channels. For the firmware, um, you usually get onto the IoT devices through either the initial deployment setup or the firmware upgrade. For data and files, it usually happens of get hitting the IoT device during the transfer or the process step. Let's first take a look at the firmware. So firmware vulnerability is a really hot topic in the last couple of years, especially if you follow the um, this organization, you follow the Upswap uh, blog post, will demonstrate the real-time analysis of what the firmware in terms, uh, what the firmware vulnerability in terms of the total number of the vulnerability. The higher purple line up in the screen demonstrate how many total vulnerabilities have been reported for the certain year, where down the, the green line below represents how many IoT-specific firmware vulnerability was reported within the total amount of the vulnerability have been reported in the year. You can see the trend of the green line is really going in the last three, four years, just mainly because the IoT attack have been so popular and have been so wildly um, expanded in the last couple of years for it becomes a much bigger security challenge for the IT organizations to maintain their network under monitor and control and secure it. So a couple of mechanisms we can prevent or ensure the firmware that got onto the IoT device is a good firmware. First and very basic one is to do the authenticate. Just making sure the firmware that you are downloading, you are installing, you are deploying onto the IoT device is truly the firmware that you want to do or you intend to do. There was no modification, there was no hijacking in the middle during the firmware transportation. The basic mechanism is to do the digital signature validation along with the certificate, or an even simpler mechanism is just to do the hash validation. Some, let's say, take an example. Somebody trying to download a firmware from Cisco for a firewall, for a firewall and then he actually pulled down the firmware from the from the Cisco website, and then he captured the hash or the MD5 and the SHARP 256, all this information about the particular firmware, and then he got assimilated by Upswa Security or, um, Solutions called Mad Defender Cloud or Mad Defender Solutions. And then this particular technology will assimilate the firmware and then do a basic calculation of the hash. And then later on, right before the firmware got deployed, we can come compare these two hashes and make sure the firmware had not been modified or had not been um, changed intentionally or, un, un, or unintentionally before the IoT device, before the firmware had actually deployed onto the IoT devices. The second mechanism we go over, the impact of this one, is if you don't actually have the firmware being authenticated, that means the firmware you are trying to deploy onto the system it's not guaranteed to be the one that you are intend to do. So this firmware can be modified, can have malware, 
many of your IoT device will be potentially infected by the firmware during its upgrade. And it's going to create significant security problems because you don't actually know about that until the attack is actually happening. The second mechanism also I propose is to detect malware before the firmware is actually deployed onto the IoT devices. Ensuring the firmware and the files are malware free, we propose to scan with multiple anti-malware engines for the highest detection rate. In here, I want to pause a little bit and take take a look at why, why we want to do the multi-scanning in this particular area. You can see if I upload a particular firmware onto Opswat's Meta Defender solutions, not all the engines or not all the anti-malware engines will be able to recognize the malware is an infected malware um, just because of the time being, whether their database, once definition database is insane, whether they be able to specialize or classify on the certain malware detections. Um, so leveraging multiple anti-malware together to do the multi-scanning technology have actually helped to improve the malware detection and reduce the exposures of the vendor issues. That means, let's say, for example, a certain anti-malware vendor has a no vulnerability. Um, for the scanning. And then you, you combine with multiple anti-malware engines, then you will be able to reduce the impact or in, even eliminate the impact um, for your detection um, mechanisms. Most importantly, if you actually took at the research that we did is in terms of like how the reaction rate or how fast multiple anti-malware engines together combined will be able to react on the outbreak, you will see like the more engine, the more, more the more anti-malware engines leading together, the, the shorter the outbreak exposure time will lead to be. Having the, having the multi-scanning or having the malware detection mechanisms right before the firmware got deployed will help you to secure the firmware and making sure the firmware itself is not compromised before it actually got to the IoT device. So later on, prevent your IoT device being compromised by the particular firmware. So detection of vulnerability is the first mechanism that we're proposing. Vulnerability on firmware is a very trendy term, as we just mentioned um, in a couple of slides back. So ensure that the firmware does not contain any known vulnerabilities. Um, it's one of the most important mechanisms to make sure the IoT security, the, the IoT firmware is not being compromised or it's not being vulnerable in the later on of the space. So scan for vulnerability before the firmware is installed is a very critical step. However, it's not easy. It's actually a very challenging step because most of the vulnerability solutions today, it has the problems that the firmware or the software need to actually got deployed and execute and, de and running on the device before he will be able to recognize the, the vulnerability. But in Upswa, we're actually um, analyzing, we actually have a unique pattern technology to associate the firmware or the binary to a particular CVE as, um, as full of big data mechanisms. Say for example, if you took at, um, take a look at this one, it's basically uploading a firmware to Meta Defender Cloud um, it will analyzing the firmware, compile its hash, and then check against our live database who, um, and see whether there is any no CVE or this particular firmware has been recognized or analyzed by either Upswa expertise or other secure or other policy security um, firms to classify this particular firmware or particular files have been vulnerable or not. You can see. Um, Detecting vulnerability in firmware is it's a very challenging step, and making it um, making it smooth and making it transport tra transparent to the actual users or the IT administrators is a very even more difficult or even more challenging step. And then firmware has vulnerability. If we don't do that, hackers will have the ability to take advantage of the vulnerability and successfully attack and exploit the device later on of the space, which then create a huge problem because, again, most of the attacks will not be detected um, until the attack is actually happened.
So the second channel we're going to take a look is the data and file transfer. Besides the firmware, data and files that actually being transferred or processed by the IoT device is a very is also a very critical channel. Um, a lot of the IoT de device have been deployed onto the organization network. Just take a small MB um, SMB organization, a company that have like 30 employees, probably running around 200 IoT devices, including printers, refrigerators, or, or file storage. A lot of this this IoT device have been hanging or deployed or leveraging within the organizations. So large amount of the data and files have been transferred and processed by this IoT device in real time. So it's just simply unrealistic to do a really deep analysis on every single piece of the data, every single piece of the files when they actually um, being processed or transferred by the IoT devices. In Upswap's proposed mechanisms, detecting malware, malware by doing hash lookups of the firmware against the existing database is one efficient way. But the other efficient ways that we're proposing is to actually leveraging a technology called data centralization. Or in this, with this technology, we can remove the embedded threat of the certain data and files during real time at really um, good performance. So just imagine for a printer. For printer use cases, that the IoT device is connecting to a lot of the a lot of the other devices within the organizations. Um, an IT administrator or accounting people or a sales people want to actually print out a clothes, print out an invoice, and send it out to the customer. So the transfer of these particular files get hit into the printer. Then if we will be able to end in a in the middle and in the processing or analyzing steps into the middle of this process, so we will be able to analyzing comes with a PDF and then we break out the PDF and then we see whether this particular PDF contains any embedded threads within the files, like the suspicious behavior like hyperlink, markers, videos, embedded objects. We stream those out, we take the file we recompile the file, reconstruct the files, and then send the files into the printer to, for the process. In this case, we will be able to ensure the printer is actually processing a good file instead of a malicious file. So some upswards method defender IoT prevention technologies. Multi-scanning, data sanitizations, and vulnerability scanning is the three main weapons or three main technologies that we are proposing to secure the IoT devices. Basically, if you look at the, the data security flow, you will see if we try to streamline or we try to ensure the data that coming in is before it hitting the IoT device is actually clean and good and trustable. So multi-scanning, we actually incorporate, we, we partner with multiple anti-malware engines, including McAfee, uh, Bitdefender, Aviva, ESET, so Chen Michaels, and we leveraging all those anti-malware engines together and take advantage of their, each of the engine's specialty um, in terms of detecting certain type of malware and then take advantage of that like, both of them combined to boost up the detection rate. Vulnerability assessment, we leveraging the list database, we, um, we cooperate with the CS, CVSS 2.0, 3.0, different mechanisms, and we also actually come up with our OSWAS risk level assessment score, severity score. Um, we're analyzing over a billion of binaries, and then we have we captures over 20,000 applications and version combinations, and then we classify over 200,000 active vulnerable binaries in our database, specifically for product installers and IoT firmwares. Data sanitizations. Data sanitizations go through three major steps. Identify and scanning the file and see whether there's any malicious contents within that, and then break the files into um, each, each, um, pick the files into different components and then 
take out the malicious elements and then reconstruct the files into a good files and then that pass the files down for usage. Um, there's another point I want to make here is uh, Opsula Meta Defender Cloud has maintained a particular uh, report called Content Design and Construction Report. Um, it classifies or it demonstrates how data centralization will be efficient to, to handle or centralize uh, infected files and turn the files or reconstruct the files into a clean files in a fast and secure way without losing the usability of the files. And securing IoT devices with OpsRA with basically two mechanisms as a small recap. Ensure the safety of the firmware that actually before they are installing or deploying onto the IoT devices. Secure the data and files that being processed or transferred to the IoT devices. These are the two main channels with multi-scanning, data centralization, and vulnerability technology that Opsua is offering. And here I'm going to pass back to Deborah um, to go over the, some of the use cases of the, of the Meta Defender um, IoT use cases. Thank you, JP. Yeah, so we wanted to highlight three uh, use cases today where Meta Defender can help secure IoT environments. Uh, the first one is patching IoT devices in a secure network. So this applies to high security networks, like for instance uh, used in nuclear facilities or utility companies, uh, but it can uh, really apply to any segregated network. So these networks are not connected to the corporate network and they have no internet connection. So the only way to get files into these networks is to bring them on a USB device. So OpSwap offers a solution called Meta Defender Kiosk. This is a kiosk that can be placed on the perimeter of the secure network. And users can use the kiosk to scan the files on the USB devices and make sure that they are free of threats before entering the secure network. So for instance, in the case of IoT, if an administrator needs to patch an IoT device within the secure network, they can um, have the firmware on their USB device, insert it into the kiosk, then have it scanned with multiple anti-malware engines. It can scan for vulnerabilities. It can also remove any embedded threats in files. And then if any threats are found, the user will be notified and the file will be blocked. If everything is good, then the administrator can proceed and, uh, to the secure network and then upgrade the firmware. So that is the first use case. The second use case is where you deploy a web proxy server together with Meta Defender ICAP server. And uh, Meta Defender will then utilize the ICAP protocol to intercept, intercept traffic on the proxy server and ensure that all the files are scanned for malware and vulnerabilities. So again, if an IT administrator needs to patch an IoT device, they will download the firmware patch through the proxy server and through Meta Defender, and the firmware will automatically be scanned for any malware or vulnerabilities. Then the last use case is protecting IoT traffic using a web proxy. So you can direct all the IoT traffic through a proxy server with Meta Defender ICAP server. And in this way, all the files that are passing through the proxy server are also automatically scanned for malware and vulnerabilities. And if there are um, files that need have, can have embedded threats, then our data sanitization technology can also remove those threats. So that brings us to the end of our webinar. Um, here are just a few useful links. Uh, so for instance, um, the website for the Internet of Things Institute is a good place to get uh, information about how to secure IoT. Um, if you want to learn more about Opswap products, 
uh, our website is at opswap.com. Then we also offer MetaDefender Cloud, which is basically an online version of our MetaDefender solution. Uh, you can find that at metadefender.opswap.com. You can scan files for free, so it's a very good way to try out the technology and see how it works. We also offer a few interesting reports. For instance, JP just showed us one of the reports, the content and this uh, arm and construction reconstruction report. We also offer reports, um, the uh, anti-malware market share report, malware outbreak report, and uh, we also have a report about anti-malware efficacy. So um, now we will go on to Q&A. So All right, great. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and open up. It looks like we have uh, three questions right now from the audience, and I'll go ahead and, and cover those. And then if, if we don't have time, we'll, we'll pass stuff over and we'll create, we'll do a blog on the remaining questions. So let's on to the first question here, and I'll, I'll pose it out to JP. Uh, I hear that some malware can go undetected by some tools. Are there any known tools that can detect the type of malware that is referred to as undetectable? Thank you, John. Um, so to answer these specific questions, um, we want to understand, or we, we can actually potentially look at what is the existing mechanisms that be able to recognize a certain threat, right? We have uh, traditional anti malware we have a little bit boost up like multi scanning we have vulnerability assessment and then um, some of the other vendors offer end, um, EDR like endpoint detection and response but all those things is based on a characteristic that the malware need to be recognized so to actually protect we only be able to protect something that we know of right we know something that's bad then we detect it and then we prevent it and we protect it but the new trendy or the new advanced cutting edge mechanism, say data centralization or CDR, that have been presented is we try to detect or we try to prevent a certain particular device or certain particular data without recognizing what whether the data is actually contains any malicious information. So we're trying to detect, uh, we're trying to prevent not based on the traditional database, um, anti malware database detection um, database. So it's a, it's a prevention not based on detection. So um, CDR data standardization is one of the key factors or one of the good mechanisms can, or good tools, good technology can be used um, to cover these undetected uh, vulnerable malware applications. And Deborah, do you have anything to add on? No, Jackie, that sounds good. Okay. Uh, this is John again. On to my next question, and this is this looks like a fairly easy one. Um, I'll, again, I'll give it to JP. Um, uh, can you give a couple examples of data to how data standardization can be used for IoT? Sure. So um, basically, any IoT device that has to do with or processing a certain particular files will be will be able to benefit by the CDR technologies. Um, for example, painters that actually, as mentioned during the um, presentation, if a, if a accounting team want to send out an invoice and then he want to print out the invoice, but he also want to make sure the invoice does not contain any malicious files. Or some um, customer support engineers want to print out a user's email uh, or the customer emails. So this is one good example like the printer usage. The other one is file storage. Like um, if I want to store a if I have a particular storage media that can, is designed to contain or storage sensitive information, we want to make sure that information that actually got into this device is a safe, it's trustable. So in this case, CDI is also a very good use case to, to add on to the benefit. And Deborah? No, I think you covered those very well. Okay. okay. And just to highlight, if, you, if anybody has any more questions, that, I have one more question here, but if anybody has anything, write in your player, you can go ahead and put some stuff in. We still have a bit of time to answer some questions live. So the final question I have right now is, uh, 
why is multi-scanning better than scanning with one anti-malware engine? So when looking at multi-scannings, um, there's three major benefits that I can see off. The first one is very obvious, it's to do detection rate. So you can see different anti-malware engines based on their different expertise, different geolocations, um, they might have different, different um, strong point or strong capability on de detecting certain type of malware. For example, Tremico, which mostly landing on the Asia um, area, ESA on the US, um, Aviva from the Germans. So all those um, engines may have their own um, unitities or their own strong points on detecting certain malware types, certain malware um, geolocations that specific for the area. And then combining them together will be able to offer a much bigger coverage in terms of um, malware detection rate. So that's a very good, um, that's one of the benefits. The other benefit is to eliminate some of the, the anti-malware um, issues or, or vendor issues or vulnerabilities. Let's say I only have one traditional anti-malware have been installed or deployed for the security solution. And then what happens if the particular anti-malware solutions have a vulnerability or being cracked by a certain device or by a certain mechanism? So in this case, you either patch your software, which need to be real-time, create a lot of like, um, production hustles, or you just need to live with a certain security for a certain periods of time. Um, that's also a risk concern. So LIDAR1 will be a good solution. But combining a multi-scanning idea, like I work with ESA, I work with Aviva, I work with multiple anti-malware engines together, can help to reduce the impact of being certain anti-malware engines become unfunctional or being vulnerable, we will be able to eliminate the impact of the overall security solutions by a certain vendors. The last one is, um, as discussed before, is to reduce the outbreak detection time. Just imagine there's a there's a particular outbreak have been cracked to specifically um, skip or evade from a certain mechanism that a particular anti-malware engine is used or rely on to do the detections. If if that's the case, then especially on the modern attack, like the APT or, or some of the modern attack uh, malware flags have been exposed in the recent times, will be able to escape or skip or, or be able to cover itself for against a certain anti-malware engines. But covering multiple anti-malware engines together and be able to scan the particular files or analyzing by multiple anti-malware engines will be able to help um, to spin up the detection um, period of time in terms of outbreaks. So that's the three main mechanisms. Yes, and I have one thing to add there as well. So the multi-scanning by Opswot uh, is not the same as, for instance, if you would just uh, deploy uh, more of your multiple anti-malware engines because uh, Opswot is actually the technology of multi-scanning makes it much faster. So it's not the same as you would use, let's say, a couple of command line antivirus scanners, but this has actually been optimized for speed and to uh, process uh, with multiple engines at the same time. And um, also it has the advantage that you don't have to manage all the AV engines separately, it's all managed in one go, it's one licensing package. Uh, so uh, yeah, those are the advantage of using uh, Opswot multi-scanning. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Deborah. And then it looks like I've, I may have one question, two more questions here. Uh, another uh, fairly straightforward one. What types of vulnerabilities exist on Internet of Things devices? So that actually is a much bigger questions we could we could answer. Um, now for example, the depends on what the IoT devices um, is actually designed for. Like if I talking about the Apple Watch or if I talking about just a watch IoT devices, then a browser may involve like the cost size scripting um, may involve into these particular cases. If I was actually talking about a database um, uh, a database storage mega, uh, IoT device then the SQL like ingestions may be involving. 
if I'm talking about an IoT device that is actually handling data or actually um, turn on or turn off light, uh, uh, a particular light bulb or network switch or something like that, then it needs to run on assemble code, then it opens up a much bigger hole of the vulnerabilities. Neither cross site scripting, neither uh, buffer overload. There's a lot of potential type of vulnerability can be exposed or or can be exist on a certain uh, IoT in terms of the the firmware and the data that is actually being processed. Okay. And then, then I finally, it looks like I've got one last question and. Uh, you know, the, the basic question is, is what about sandboxing? You know, can you, do we do sandboxing? You know, what's the, uh, the you know, how do we compare and contrast to sandboxing? So, um, sandboxing with the current stage often um, compare with, with like multi-scanning, sandboxing, one to do static analyze, the other one to do dynamic analyze. Um, we are not suggesting to just now, replace sandboxing. Our proposition is that we're trying to work with sandboxing, we're trying to work with multiple anti-malware um, security solutions together. But sandboxing have, have its own um, drawbacks, which is the performance. And it's really no guarantee on when and how long will we will be able to efficiently detect a particular malware. What happens especially on a malware that actually decides we are time bomb? It actually has decided to only um, functional after two hours of, of, of sleep of deployment. So for sandboxing, it's going to be a really resource um, costly effect during the analyze for this particular type of, um, of malware. Uh, in the other sense, to do static analyze multi-scanning and then to do some mechanism like CDR, basically have a good performance impact. It opens up the capability to do uh, or analyze or secure the IoT device um, tra traffic and, and the files and the data have been passing along across different IoT devices just because the performance and the reliability um, overall combination is pretty good compared to the sandboxing in this area. Yeah, and one thing to add there is also that uh, malware nowadays is being built sandbox aware, so it can uh, evade uh, sandboxes and um, yeah, that's another reason why just relying on only sandboxes is uh, not a good idea. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you, Deborah and JP, and thank you for joining the Securing IoT Trust no, no Thing webinar. Uh, we've uploaded some helpful attachments to the player below, so go ahead and take a look at them if you're interested in more information. And if you want to learn more about OpsWatt, you can go to www.opswat.com. Thank you.